Okay, let's get started. Weekend spaces number 26. This is the angel swing as usual. And I've been doing this for a while now. We have a vibrant Discord community, uh, almost 100 members. That's also something we're figuring out what to do when we hit 100. So that's some surprise might be coming there. And uh, as usual for new listeners, let's hear from Casper what the angel swing is all about. Hello, hello. Welcome to all listeners. Uh, I for recorded. We are the Angel Swing, founded by international friends who met through our beloved Meta Angels project. We have our OGs from Europe, Johannes, and Espresso on the Angel Swing account, Yoon from the US, and Rebel and myself are from Asia. Driven by our common passion to showcase independent artists and their art, and helping them stand out from the crowded NFT market that's pretty much dominated by generative 10k PFP projects. So we showcase the art in an on-cyber virtual gallery as a larger collection of art brings a cross-pollination of viewership and this has helped quite a few of our artists which collect this uh, more effectively through sales. And I'm glad to say we have organically grown since into a community of artists and collectors, but most importantly, friends. With regular Twitter spaces like these, which are then recorded into podcast formats in Spotify and YouTube. Last but not least, the easiest way to get in touch with us would be to join our cozy Discord. Everything's on our link tree in our bio, so hit us up if you're an indie artist who needs help featuring your art, or if you just want to join a friendly art and NFT community. That's pretty much it. Back to you, Espresso. Thank you. Today we have a repeat guest, Daniel Tanner, aka Swombat, uh, back. So a big welcome to you. Thank you. And the topic today is something we briefly mentioned last time, which is around NFT lending and market dynamics. And specifically, as a follow-up to the Ben Dao situation a few weeks back, that was like September 9th, 10th, 11th, if I recall. Correctly. But before we go into to that specific topic, let's start with the current state of the NFT market, because Daniel here is both a serial entrepreneur and an NFT market expert. So eager to hear your take on where we are at the moment and if there's any big notable news lately. First of all, I'd like to say that I think the idea of an NFT market expert at this point is a little bit premature. I don't think there's any experts in the market. It's not even 100% clear, as I shared in a sort of video a couple of weeks ago, it's not even clear to me that there is an NFT market. There than being NFT market experts seems to be a kind of step too far, possibly. But if there is an NFT market, then we can like maybe say things about what it might look like at the moment, which is with this level of caution, as far as I'm willing to go, rather than say, make bold statements about I think we're asserting into existence. Hope that's all right with you. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. As people have probably noticed uh, that there's been a number of big sales recently. There's been a couple of projects that have launched that have picked up some good activity. I need to update one of my reports to see if they've really pick, like really broken into the sort of top activity rankings and so on. So I don't have that data right now. But it does seem like there's a bit more activity than there was a few months ago. You can see that also in the stats that I am still tracking and posting to the various discords that it has been actually since end of August, there's been a kind of slow rise of activity. And it seems to be like it has actually dropped over the last few days. As usual, when you start to think, oh, it's going up, it starts to go the other way. But there are encouraging signs around the large sales of punks and whatever, which usually I think could be, they could be seen as a sign that some people are betting that the market is going to go up and some people with substantial amounts of money are, or we could be misreading that. But there's quite a few of them, so it's starting to look a bit more like a trend than just a few isolated incidents. 
is the market looking up? I think we're always just one market crash away from things getting worse again. I wouldn't make any overly risky bets on this basis. But I am feeling a little bit hopeful that maybe we may like, like having some kind of some bull market or something at some point. Like it's, it's very hesitant at this point. But it looks better than it did a month ago. I'll put it that way. Yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> mm. uh, like a month ago was basically when it bottomed, as co- according to my charts. That was the worst, like the top 10 report that I've been tracking for quite a while. That one bottomed on August 30th. And it's been like going back up since, slowly but gently. But it's not gone, gone up massively, so it's not, it's not party time yet. But there has been a sort of trend up rather than trend down. So maybe we're a month or two away from some kind of more bull market issue. It's possible. A lot of people are asserting right now is that the NFT market can't have a, a bull market while there's a macro like uncertainty and like macro bear market and so on. And I don't think that's true. Uh, there's a couple of ways to see it. One of the ways that I see it is that the those 10 KPFP projects that you mentioned are basically just look like small businesses. And this is a small business fundraising market. And more fundraising continues to happen in bear markets, in recessions, like many great businesses get founded in recessions. It doesn't stop just because there's a macro bear market. So great businesses can get founded and funded in this market as well. And people can get enthusiastic about those. Another angle, which I find interesting, is that I don't know if you've, you might have encountered this idea that the, um, whilst crypto will go and respond to whatever's going on in the macro context, much faster than, say, the NASDAQ or the FTSE. Uh, it, it basically gets all the bonds out of the way really quickly, and then it stagnates and then goes back up much more quickly as well once it actually starts picking up. Like the swings, the volatility is much higher. FT is like a further amplification of that, possibly. Like that would be one possible theory, in which case it could be that NFTs bottomed out even more quickly than crypto. And then if things start looking up in the macro, even if they look up just a little bit, that could be enough to get a sort of little bull market going in the NFT space. So those are all very optimistic takes. I want to continue to paraphrase that with the possibility that there is no safe NFT market so that we don't get too lost in that illusion. But that seems like a reasonable, those seem like reasonable statements to me to make about, quote, the NFT market. Nice. Thank you. Because the reason for asking is also because there's, there seems to be like anecdotally some new energy in the market, some new things happening, but it's hard to view it uh, in aggregate and say that, yes, we are entering a new phase, but it's, there's certainly some... I need to fix my stats engine instead of messing around with lighting equipment to, for my YouTube videos. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> but it's really <laughs> fun to mess around with the lighting equipment. <laughs> Did you like, I just got a new key light uh, and stuff. Like it's, uh, I, I was doing that just before this call. <laughs> it's fun. It's more yep. fun than fixing the stats engine. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the stats have been super useful for a long time. So I appreciate to, to see those continuing. And I think, the, like you mentioned, the, there was some punk sales. So there was especially this one uh, very big sale of this ape punk. People joke that ape punk, what's that? Because it's either apes or punks. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that particular sale seemed like a more of like an one of that could have happened at any point because as far as I saw the account that bought it had the, almost exactly 3,300 ETH from five years ago so they, they just decided to spend it now that was my take on that particular that, one that's pretty strange I hadn't heard that that does seem very odd they just had 3,300 ETH that they hadn't touched for years and then their only activity is to buy an ape punk that, yeah. that smells funny to me. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Let's see. Maybe it's something more uncovers. And, like um, an active trader would not just sit on 3,300 ETH for ages. Obviously, it is a wallet of somebody who has other wallets. That is yeah. obvious from that. Otherwise, they wouldn't spend their entire net worth on one ape punk. And so the question is, who is it the person who owns the punk in the place? Because punks are zero royalty as well. The, it could be a wash trade as well. You always have to ask yourself that in NFTs. Is it a wash yeah. trade? Yeah, we've seen a fair amount of that, unfortunately, as well. 
So yeah, and, and then there was QQL, which is interesting because it's yeah. an art project. And, uh, and it's got, it, it picked up that kind of enthusiasm that few projects have had, even the ones that have done reasonably well recently. Like before my stats engine broke, I could see that like Digi Daiku or whatever that was like getting a lot of attention was still not getting the sort of level of activity that, so for example, so in the relevance ranking that I calculated in my new stats engine, which again, note it's broken for the last few weeks and it's not picking up new projects for the last few weeks, so I need to fix that. But before that, it was picking up new projects. And I could see that when World of Women Galaxies launched, for example, it went straight into the top 10 for uh, including old projects, including like new projects. So it had very high level of activity right up front. Same for other side, it had like insane amounts of activity right up front. Whilst Digi Daiku and all these kind of projects that have popped up over the last few months have gotten some attention, but not enough trading to get anywhere near the top 10. So that was different. And yeah. at some point in the next week, hopefully I'll have fixed that SaaS engine. I can tell you whether it's, it's changed, whether projects are getting in the top 10. QQL probably is. I wouldn't be surprised if it is. Probably. And it's also interesting because most of the, at least the, the primary activity was not on OpenSea, so everyone had mm. to adjust their, their tooling to this new marketplace, right? There's been a couple of sales, like secondary sales of minted QQLs, and those have also been on Archipelago, this new mm-hmm. uh, art marketplace. So yeah, but yeah, interesting stuff. And as a side note, the QQL project has been a big hit also in our community, like we've been generating and sharing outputs and whatnot. So I think we'll dive more into that in a later episode, like the mechanics of it. But it's good to see that there are some projects launching now and getting traction, even though, of course, it drops. So he could probably have launched any time. And specifically what caught our eye was this Spendalo uh, news. And I know Casper has been looking more into this. That means, Casper, why don't you introduce that topic and what we're aiming to, to cover with that? Yeah, thanks, Espresso. NFT lending is actually quite of interest to me because... I also have keen interest in DeFi a lot more before this pair market. Just for the benefit of new listeners who are not so familiar with NFT lending, this news article that was launched in the Singapore news where this guy loaned out his board ape to a site called NFT Fi. And even though he failed to meet the borrowing terms, he apparently engaged the lender on a side agreement not to foreclose on his ape. But the guy did it anyway. So he actually went to the Singapore courts to enforce his rights on the NFT. And actually, that's how I got to find out about this NFT lending protocol. So NFT Fi is a site which matches lenders and borrowers on individual NFT assets. But obviously, they're only blue chips. So you can actually go in there, list your board ape, your world of women NFT on the protocol and find a willing lender of ETH or DAI to lend you their liquid asset or a reasonable APR that the both of you decide. But this is most importantly on a single asset. Now, how that's different on Bandao is that Bandao is, of course, a collective lending protocol, which pretty much pools all the assets from the borrowers and then pools all the ETH from the lenders. And what this enables you to do as a lender is basically get a decent APR for your ETH, which I have done so for the past couple of weeks, but nothing to shout about. Probably going to buy a few McDonald's meals. That's pretty much it. The APR now is about 8% plus. But I would say they have improved on their product. Barring that incident that, that happened a few weeks ago that Espresso mentioned about because of the forced selling, potentially bringing down floor prices of some of these blue chip projects, they have even enabled some quite, I would say, ingenious features of the site, like buying NFTs on a down basis. So pretty much like buying a house on a mortgage. You pay a down payment. 
and then you pay subsequent payments of which includes interest. So that's pretty much the summary of the two sites that I look at. Bandao, which is a collective lending borrowing site, and NFT5, which is individual NFT loans. Just to be clear, I have no investment in these two protocols at all, no longer anyway. I think we just wanted to get a sense from Daniel about his thoughts on NFT lending. Does it help or does it not? Oh my God. <laughs> where, where do I start? As I listen to you, and I've, I've looked into this space and stuff, but as I listen to you and try to listen to it with fresh ears, I'm like struck by the incredible riskiness and I would say foolishness of building these kind of mortgage-like things and these loans and so on and these terms like blue chip on something that's so new and unproven and unreliable and unstable as NFTs. People have adopted this idea of blue chips. Like they've just accepted that there's such a thing as blue chips. They haven't really questioned that belief, most people. And they've gone and built lending protocols on the back of that. The entire concept of blue chips in NFT is incredibly shaky, incredibly, I don't know, I struggle to come up with terms that describe just how thin it is to go and do lending or to go and take a mortgage to buy it like basically take a mortgage to buy a so-called blue chip nft like this feels to me like my, my reaction is this feels to me like really inappropriate application of like financial instruments and financial tools that's my reaction obviously like people may disagree and some people may think that yeah blue chips are really solid and world of women is like great and so on and like Basie is obviously rock solid and can do no wrong and so on. I look at those projects and my very contrarian view is that like even Basie is massively overpriced, like to the tune of 80% overpriced. And treating things as blue chips seems insane to me. Like assuming that somehow they're going to maintain the value that they have just because they've maintained it for about six months. What insanity is this? <laughs> like, like, and then going and taking the risk, like risking your money and lending it against these blue chips to get an 8% APR, that's more insanity. 8% is not that much. I get that like, you can get 8% loaning to a business with a 10 year track record and revenues and all that kind of stuff. You can get those kind of percentages loaning directly to businesses. You don't need to loan on basically hot air, which is what NFTs are at the moment, mostly to get 8%. If it was like 90% APR or something, I'd be like, okay, you're using the NFT holders for massive amounts of money because it's a massively risky. It needs to be a risk rewards ratio that's maintained. The risk of loaning against blue chip NFTs is insanely high and the return is only 8%. That's, that doesn't seem like a, a worthwhile risk reward ratio to me. I'd rather put my money in Celsius at this stage. I'll start with these thoughts and I'm happy to hear reactions. Maybe somebody disagrees and thinks that actually blue chips are really solid and I'm just wrong about all this. And it's totally legit to take on a mortgage level of debt to buy a board ape, which in my view might be worth less than 20 ETH in six months. But yeah, I want to hear somebody else's thought on this. Yeah, before Johannes speaks... Can I just clarify, Daniel, your issue with the concept of NFT lending is the concept of blue chips. How about adding on this layer of, would it be okay if somehow the NFT market was more stable? Yeah, so what we've got is, so we've got a bunch of projects. Let's call them businesses because I think a lot of them are basic businesses. A lot of them are, have extremely shaky business models if they have any business model at all. Like the whole hoo-ha about royalties and stuff and projects having their revenues taken away. That is not revenue, getting royalties from your from your investors. That's, okay, makes sense for artists. As we discussed last time, it might make sense for artists and stuff, but it's not revenue for a business to like squeeze money out of your investors when they're trading your like proxy shares in the form of NFTs. And so a lot of the, those businesses, don't really have defined business models, are still figuring it out, which, to be fair, is true of many startups. But startups are at least trying to build towards a legit business model, and they often have a kind of track record, and some of them have achieved some kind of revenue, and have concrete plans to build some kind of sustainable business or to get some kind of viable or reasonable exit event that they're building towards. A lot of these NFT projects 
are started by people who haven't started businesses before. They have very little business experience. They haven't got any idea of wanting to build a business model. They don't really know what they're doing. And plus, even people who have business experience don't really know what they're doing in this space. It's all super uncertain. Now, startups are incredibly volatile. You can't really predict which ones are going to make and which ones aren't until they get, basically until they get to an exit event, you still, as an investor, have the risk that the startup might just, you know, crash and burn suddenly over the course of six months. I've invested in like very legitimate, very good sounding businesses that were like by serial entrepreneurs who knew what they were doing, had the connections, were building a, a totally valid project, a product that had great value in the enterprise data space, like stuff that should have worked. And at some point it seemed to work and at some point it just crashed and burned in about six months and they had to, uh, they ran out of money and they had to merge with, with another company and all the shareholders got wiped out and stuff like that. So that happens even with a multi-year-old startup which has revenues and has serial entrepreneurs who know what they're doing, have VC connections and all that kind of stuff. So the idea of then taking these new projects, these new businesses and trying to apply anything that relies on lending and that kind of stuff seems insane to me. That applies to all of them, not just blue chips. I think the concept of blue chips is a, a mirage at this point. But for all the NFT projects, even the ones that I think are doing really well, I wouldn't go and borrow money on the back of them or lend money on the back of them because they could crash and burn in a surprisingly short time. They have a fairly high risk of doing that because they're startups. Cool. I think those are very valid points. I definitely have follow-up queries on that. But uh, Johannes, you wanted to ask a question? Yeah. I fully agree that I would never start a mortgage to once get a and pay back for a long time to, yes, uh, finally have that overpriced JPEG. But from the other side, it's maybe a good tool. Let's imagine I have a bought ape and I can't get the money on the open market that I would like to see. Then the first strategy would be to make a fractional NFT out of it. But this is something which seems to me super uncommon, but this DAO is more known, so I can make my very non-fungible token a little bit more fungible by converting it to some ease, so it's going to be more liquid than before, which means I'm now able to sell half of my ape, but not really exactly half of my ape. So it's not any longer one NFT for me, it's a little bit more split. It. I can take a loan out of it, play with the money, and maybe buy it back or not. What do you think about this? That this is a, a way to make it... A way to provide liquidity, right? For your very yeah, liquid NFT. Exactly. I have tracked the fractional market. It's not that high. But at least if I can put it on Bendao, then I can make it liquid. Yeah, you can. And we can. And we are clearly doing this thing. And you can take a mortgage to buy a board ape. And maybe some people are basically doing that. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. And... There's a, I'm sure you've encountered this concept of the crypto and the NFT and actually the general economy being massively over leveraged. And this is a form of leverage where you have the same asset, for example, you have two board apes and you took a loan for 50% of their price and you use it to buy a third board ape. That may look like there's more demand for board apes, but actually it's just like leverage building up. And the more that builds up across an economic system, the more the danger is when things turn sour that the deleveraging happens. And then the deleveraging makes the downturn much harsher. So you can't do that. But there's a reason why you know, in the real economy, only banks are allowed to do this kind of lending. And like lenders are basically heavily regulated. And even their level of regulation is usually criticized as being insufficient. Like people talk about how basically banks can create money out of thin air and so on because the government authorizes them. In crypto, we're doing that without asking anybody's authorization. And that probably creates this effect that I was talking about earlier. When crypto starts falling, it falls much faster and much harder than all the rest because it's much more leveraged. Everybody's tr trading at 50x leverage without even knowing it because there's all these kind of lending and reuse of assets going on. This is just one more form of that, what you're describing. And yes, we can do that. But is it set on the back of an asset that's really volatile? Is it a good yeah. thing for the market, for the economy? I'm not sure. I mean, I don't think so. That's not but, but you would never get a credit from a bank uh, for one week. But if you are going to lend your bank, you can say, just for one week, I need that money. And the shorter the time frame, 
the lower the risk, I would say, or it's not that high. Nobody knows what happens in half a year, but I can be some kind of sure that in one week, uh, punks will stay uh, at this floor price. Yeah, even in the short time frame, did you hear about this project called Azuki? Yes. <laughs> 30 ETH plus and stuff, and then the founder revealed themselves to be a serial scammer, and the project dumped massively in the space of a couple of days. Like, the risk is really high. For a stock like Apple to dump like Azuki did, I don't know what they'd need to do. I don't think there's anything they can do that would dump their stock that hard. Like, the entire senior team and everybody in Apple was at the Apple Center and got nuked or something, and then probably the stock will dump. Kill everyone in the company. That would probably dump the stock of Apple. But there's no action a single individual could take that would take down the Apple stock to that extent, which is why it's a blue chip. It's quite solid. It's still vulnerable to macroeconomic things, but it's not going to just disappear overnight. I say that. It happened to some banks as well in the last uh, financial crisis. But with all these NFT projects, that is incredibly possible. It's a fairly high probability. That to me means that you shouldn't be lending large amounts of money on the back of those. I wouldn't. Obviously, some people do, and that's their choice. I think it's very risky to do so. Yeah, so I think my additional thoughts leading up before Johannes chipped in on his thoughts of providing liquidity is I feel these lending protocols actually provide a service and so the Bandau APR of 8%, it's pretty much matched to the collective risk, right? Because you're lending against a much larger pool, your risk is lower than an individual asset. But if you went on NFT Fi, and Johannes said, if you lent out your bought it for just a week, you can get APRs as high as 30 to 90%. So that addresses what you mentioned about risk reward. I fully understand and I fully agree with you that 8% is silly to kind of park money there, but I did it just for the heck of it to say I've done it before. And I think the second point that what Johannes was alluding to was, I actually see these NFT lending platforms in a sense, when you lend out your NFT or you borrow ETH against your NFT, you are basically buying a put option and the lenders of ETH are selling a put option to the borrowers because that's what happens on NFT5. When I went on the site, I actually tried to find assets which were priced a little off, I think 40% or lower. And I couldn't find something. So there would be DGENs who obviously accepted much higher LTVs and they got the deals instead. What I realized was a, lo a lot of these NFT owners were basically going on the site, trying to find people willing to accept LTV ratios, loan to value ratios of say 90%. When the floor price dips below that, they are basically in the money because they have bought that put option and they were in the loan. Essentially, they have sold out their NFT for that LTV. So I think my perspective of this is that, sure, it's not pretty at all from a risk perspective, especially in this bear market. But I would argue that maybe it provides a service and you're not forced to use it, right? It's just the degenerates of all of us, or rather the general crypto space that makes it dangerous. It's not the tools that, that cause it. What do you say to that argument? Yeah, it, it's what you apply the tools to. So if you apply financial instruments to your houses and factories and companies like Apple and so on, they make a lot of sense. If you apply them to s small business shares, for example, they start to make less sense because those are very volatile. And NFTs are a kind of analog for small business shares that's even more volatile and even more flaky. To me, that makes even less sense. A hammer makes sense. And you can use it very profitably for many things. If you want to dig a hole in the ground, maybe the hammer is not the best tool for that. <laughs> you mentioned about banks being regulated. Do you see regulation as being the key here? Or how do you see this tool being refined enough that you would see this benefiting the ecosystem? That's a good question. I don't really have a good answer to that. There's a kind of fine line between investing and trading and gambling, as I think we, we're all aware. And the more every, everybody accepts that you can't predict short-term volatility, or well, most people, like, eventually they accept after they lose all their money that they can't predict short-term volatility. So the closer I think you get to basically betting on short-term volatility, 
the closer you get to gambling, the closer you get to betting on long-term outcomes based on fundamentals and the founders and the belief in the product and the market and things like that, the closer you get to investing. And somewhere in the middle, there's trading where you like trading on some, there's some information you're trading on, but it's also a little bit gambly because it's a bit like a, a very well-managed game of poker. It feels to me like those tools apply to something with so much volatility, basically tend to nudge it towards like gambling, which clearly there's a lot of demand for gambling on NFTs. We've seen that over the last couple of years. There's a lot less demand right now than there was a year ago, but there's still a fair bit of demand because there's still, it's, it was under the $10 million, but there was still $10 million of trading going on NFT on, on OpenSea uh, like a, few, a week or two ago. So every day. So there's clearly still some activity going on. The better use case of NFTs is actually funding. There's lots of really interesting businesses being created all the time. So getting to the point where they get access to this global fundraising marketplace and that innovation funding model is exported to as much of the world as possible, that seems very desirable to me. It has a really positive impact on the world. It would re result in more businesses, more future apples and Microsoft and so on, starting like today being funded by NFTs. That creates lots of value for everybody around the world. A business like Google has created insane amounts of value for everyone around the world. We want more businesses like that in the world. Some of those could be funded by NFTs and therefore manage to raise substantial funding, even though they're based somewhere in a place where geographically, normally they would have no access to this kind of funding. I don't know, a team somewhere in some little town in Brazil might be able to raise a few million dollars because, you know, NFT projects have successfully done that. They could raise a few million dollars and use that to build the next Google. If you're building a tech business of that kind, it's basically a Silicon Valley still. So there's a huge benefit to like getting that funding process working across the world. Whilst when I look at, okay, how do we make tools so that gamblers can gamble better on NFTs? I feel less inspired by that. Yeah. Okay. People might use them and that's fine. Like, you know, I don't have any objections to people gambling with their money. They are adults. They can do what they want. But I don't feel inspired. I'm not inspired by better gambling tools. Yes, there is a market need for that. Sure, some people want to gamble more on NFTs, but that doesn't get me. I don't wake up in the morning thinking, that's what the world needs more of. Gambling tools for NFT holders. Sure, I understand your perspective, Daniel. But latching on to your, what you mentioned again about uh, being inspired by NFTs, potentially being as a, used as a funding tool. By the way, I watched your YouTube episode on Kickstarter versus Startup. I enjoyed it. It was really fun with all the animations. Thank you. If you watch those videos and you have feedback, please let me know. I'm easy to find and I'm really at the beginning of this YouTube journey. So any feedback, things that you notice that could be improved, please let me know. I'm always open. Find me on Discord or Twitter. My point was uh, back on to this topic of NFTs being pretty much, in, in your view, startup funding, right? Wouldn't you agree that, let's put aside the gambling nature of DGENs in the crypto space, wouldn't you agree that a more thriving ecosystem and secondary market that's available for funding? I believe in a traditional world, even in startup financing, when you have equity investments in startups, there is still an existing set for, let's say, startup shares. And the development of this ecosystem is vital to ensure that Investors remain engaged and interested in the space. These tools could potentially be seen not just from a gambler's point of view, but as a developmental tool for the ecosystem in terms of encouraging liquidity for startup financing, in a sense. Yeah, I suppose you could make that case. It's a question of how is there enough liquidity already in the NFT markets? I guess it depends on which time of the year you ask that. Yeah, you bring up a lot of examples of the blue chips being bought apes. But what about, let's say we redefine blue chips as the Metal Angels project that we all really love. Not financial advice, but we're all pretty much invested in that. But yeah, why not yes. have a market that supports investment in, the, in these projects? And so there I would say it depends on what you're comparing it to. And you said that, oh, the startup funding market has secondary market liquidity. It doesn't really. Like you buy the shares as an early investor, as an angel investors, and you're stuck on the rides for until liquidity events. VCs might try to buy you out to clear up the cap table at some point. Usually you don't get a good price when that happens. So it's not a particularly cheerful event. 
maybe like for later stage startups, there might be some uh, over the counter trading between shareholders and get money before the liquidity event so that they feel less pressure to just focus only on the liquidity event. There's, there's various bits like that, but it's very ad hoc. It's extremely li- liquid. And uh, so I wouldn't say that there's any secondary market for startup shares. So when you compare it to that desert, the and you ignore all the kind of like lending and all these kind of additional tools that increase liquidity. Like Meta Angels is fine. Disclaim, I have, I think about 35 or 40 Meta Angels and stuff. I'm not expecting to be able to just dump them tomorrow and get the so floor price for them. It's, it's a long-term investment. I expect that because I think Ali and Alex are fantastic founders, it might still fail. I think they've got about as good chances as, as anybody does in this space. So I'm curious to see what they do with this. I expect that at some point in the next couple of years, I will open my portfolio management app and I'll see, oh, cool, my meta angels are worth 10 times as much. And at that point, I might sell some, I might sell all of them. I don't know what I'll do at that point. But it's that kind of time horizon. And I don't need to trade them day to day because if we're doing startup investing, startups don't get built in a week. You don't really need to trade them week in, week out. It should be a case of you buy them and then you wait, give them time to deliver stuff. And then at some point, you might make a decision to pull out. But those decisions should be quite infrequent. You don't really need huge amounts of liquidity. You just need more liquidity than what's actually available in the startup space right now. So yes, encouraging more trading does help. But ironically, I think those tools like NFT5 and Bendao focus on blue chip projects, which are already heavily traded anyway. They don't need that much help getting more trading going. If they did the lending for Meta Angels, that might be interesting, yeah, because Meta Angels is quite a liquid at the moment. But did that for other side, it's one of the most heavily traded NFT projects in history. There's not a lot of benefit to making that even more easy to trade and leverage. I think Yoon has had her hand up for quite a while. Yes, thank you. Daniel, you've been quite critical with reasonable points. And I've been wondering what actually excites you about the NFT space and what keeps you in the space. Uh, NFTs are still very connected to art or mixed with art and the PFP concept. Would it make sense to decouple this concept of use in NFTs as startup funding from art and PFPs? And if so, then how could we do that? It might make sense, and I'm sure somebody will try. In fact, some startups have tried. Like, there are some that sell the same image for everyone. Like, Flawed Ape, which is a portfolio management tool. I bought 20 of their Flawed Ape tokens, and they're all identical. So they didn't bother with the PFP thing. They have a piece of art to to represent the token, but it's the same art for everyone. The Hug, which I'm also invested in, went halfway between the two. They have a, a number of pieces of art, but there's a lot of repetition. And I think we're going to try all these different models. Personally, I think actually having the art is helpful if you want to benefit from the marketing effect of getting people to own your project as their identity. And people can be very passionate about projects they invest in. In the traditional investment world, first of all, most people are blocked off from making investments in most companies because of accredited investor rules. And even if they invest via, I think in the US, there's something called Republic or something. In the UK, there's Crowdcube and Cedars. And there's a bunch of companies like that do crowdfunding in equity. Even with those, like people are very excited to be investing in a company and feel like they own a little piece of a company. And with NFTs, even though they don't even actually own the piece of the company, they feel excited to include it. Like a lot of people have some kind of dream to start a business and take part in starting a business and be part of one of the success stories. And by enabling them to like almost wear your startup's branding as a badge of pride on Twitter and stuff, you're getting free marketing while getting the investors even more emotionally connected to the startup. I think that's a benefit. If I launch like a, a startup and I try to fund it via NFT sales, I, I will be able to have art associated with it that is ident- identifiable, personal, that people can fall in love with and can use to represent the company on social media because I think that's worth the investment. It's worth involving an artist and getting that kind of effect. And the cost of that is that you have to pay an artist something that should be okay. I'm generally okay with things that result in artists getting paid because they need to eat as well. <laughs> so if this new way of doing funding results in more artists getting paid because investment and art become tied together, that feels like a good outcome to me. People will try to disentangle them and do them separately, and we'll see how that works. Like, humanity is regularly trying a bit of everything and seeing what works. 
And I guess we're going to see that in the NFT space. I'm hoping that the entangled version is the one that wins. These are good points. If we want to take NFT seriously as startup funding, I think like the founders, they need to talk them. The projects are anonymous. How can you take like something like this seriously? Yeah, we do need better founders. There's definitely an issue there. I could rant for the next hour about all the problems with, <laughs> with NFT projects. <laughs> so I don't think we have the time for that. But one of them is definitely inexperience of the founders and also this kind of feeling that because it's a new space and it's NFTs and it's different from startups, like a lot of projects rejected the label of startups and they want to be something different. They all the lessons, like we've got decades of startup, like how to do a startup web learnings that we could import almost identically, like straight into most NFT projects. And a lot of NFT founders will reject that because no, we're doing an NFT project, we're not doing a startup which seems very foolish to me, but you can't stop founders from, from being headstrong. That's usually part of the features. <laughs> yeah. On the topic of startup funding, it also comes to mind a recent case with, with projects taking VC funding in addition. I've seen this in a couple of projects and the case I'm thinking of is Doodles most recently, where listening to this overpriced JPEG episode about that piece of news actually disappointed me in that the NFTs were portrayed as collectibles. Like as soon as the VC funding news hit, suddenly the VCs own the project. Yeah. And the yeah, NFTs well, are collectibles. Yeah, I mean I'm gonna be very, very harsh and direct with my opinions on this. And they might be very controversial, so please I'm sorry if I trigger you. I think the reason why it seems like bad news that all these projects are getting VC funding is because the design of the value proposition of the NFTs was exceedingly poor or non-existent. And that's true for Doodles, for Basie, for like all these high profile projects, which is another reason why I'm very cautious to call these blue chips because it's not clear what value they actually have. They don't actually give ownership into the company. There's no actual benefits attached to them that are really that tangible. It's unclear why they should be worth anything. Now, I think there are ways to build value into the NFTs. If we take Meta Angels as an example, but the core project of Meta Angels is to build this kind of almost favors exchange network and make that like really work with the wishing well and so on. If that works well and having a Meta Angel as a ticket to gaining access to that, then the Meta Angel has implicit value there. And it doesn't matter if Angel Labs or whatever they called it, doesn't matter if they get VC funding because the token has value that's intrinsic to its usefulness. However, if Meta Angels was just like, oh, we're building a brand and you're going to own part of our brand, I consider that an anti-pattern of value proposition. In fact, my next video is going to be about that, various anti-patterns, which I'll give you the spoilers ahead of time. The three that I address are community, culture, we're building a brand, we're building a global brand. Those are three ways that many startups or many NFT projects pretend that they have some kind of value when actually they don't. None of those things are actually strong, tangible value for the project. What a lot of those high-profile projects have done. That's why people are up in arms, because the token value was very poorly defined. It was very vague. It was basically just wishful thinking. And now the VCs have come and they're like, yeah, we'll have the value, please, which is totally their right. Startups have sold a bunch of shares, which is also their right. The problem is that they had not defined a value for the, for the NFTs. They didn't define what, why is it worth actually having a doodle. I think I reviewed doodles at one point, And my conclusion was that, meh, like, yeah, maybe the collectible angle. Like, it was unclear what exactly the value of, uh, of owning a doodle was to me. There was some Ponzi value, but other than that, it wasn't very clear. That's why people are upset then when VCs come and just buy it. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's, it's poorly defined, like all over the place in all the projects. And this is true, huh? especially for those, those blue chips, which is why I think it's hilarious that they're considered to be the reliable ones. Like somebody was poking at the World of Women business plan recently on Twitter and being attacked for not backing women-led projects. Just because it's a women-led project and it's about women doesn't mean it doesn't need a business plan. It's still a, a startup, basically, and it's okay to poke at the business plan. And if there's no value defined, it doesn't matter if it's called World of Women, it's still garbage, basically. And that's true of, I think, pretty much every single one. I can't think of a blue chip project that doesn't have this problem. I suppose there's a very far, very remote chance that uh, the other side project somehow takes off so spectacularly that it creates 
a multi billion dollars like multi hundred billion dollars company that somehow manages to pay the owners of other sides tokens like all the money that they seem to be wishing upon i think it's a very slim chance but some people might be willing to bet on that and that's basically a land sale right they're buying into the the promise of someone creating a lot of value on their plot of land and they well, getting a share of it well, it's a very badly designed security as well. Talking about overpriced JPEGs, there was a really great episode where she talks to somebody about land sales and stuff, land values. And uh, he explains quite clearly that the incentives basically end up working against... Basically, if it behaves as land, then the way it's been done doesn't make any sense. It can't succeed because if you build something on the other side, you're going to have to pay taxes to the landowners. And they're like, wait, but there's nothing on your land. Why should I pay taxes for it? And... So the closer it behaves to land, the less likely it is that anything gets built on it. The less it behaves like land, the more likely that it might have some value. You don't actually want it to behave like land if you want it to succeed. It's a really good podcast episode. I really recommend it. We'll find it and link it in show notes. My key takeaway from that episode was that land relies on a lot of kind of real world concepts to be valuable, like proximity to a lot of other activity. Yeah. And we don't have yeah, yeah. that in the digital realm, right? Yeah, other side, there's nothing happening in other sides at all. So why would anybody want to build anything there? Like the only people who are on the other side are people who are hoping to make money from creators building something on the other side. A number of you guys are creators, you're artists. Do you want to go and create stuff on a platform where you're just going to get taxed immediately for no reason? Probably not. <laughs> like, there's Probably plenty not. of other options. And if there aren't other options just yet, somebody will create one. These virtual worlds are free. Land is absolutely free. It costs nothing to create. You can create more and more Minecraft land for free. So why should you pay, whether it's NFT worlds or other side or whatever? If they bring a lot of eyeballs and maybe, but they need to bring a lot of people to other sides for that to work. I wish them luck. Yeah. And going back to where we started this also means that blue chips are going to be very volatile for a long time until they have some kind of defined purpose and value proposition. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I'm so bearish on them and so hesitant to apply sort of things that normally apply to houses and legitimate businesses and so on to especially the ones that are being called blue chips, which seem to be the least reliable ones. Like Meta Angels is not a blue chip, but actually at least they're trying to build something. Like what's another project we mentioned? The hug is not a blue chip, but they're trying to build something. Um, Blamaverse, I'm also a member of that. It's like it's not a blue chip, but they're trying to build something. But all the blue chips I can think of, other than Basie with other side, maybe they're actually just building hot air, as far as I can tell. I'm not very optimistic about their value. Yeah, good point. Sir. I appreciate that some people would disagree strenuously with me, and that's their right. Yeah, that's, uh, that is my perspective, though. It's great to have these discussions and bring up all of the viewpoints. Any final questions from? of my lovely co-hosts. I am really waiting for your next video because I enjoyed the uh, last one where you compared the NFT market with the tulip market some centuries ago. Uh -huh. yeah, so was... I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, I need to, now that I've got new lights, I actually need to re-record it because like, I'm recording that I haven't edited yet. And I'm like, oh, now I have proper lights with better light balance and stuff. Oh, shit, I need to record it properly. <laughs> so you'll have to wait a few days. <laughs> Yeah, I have no further questions from me. Thanks, Daniel. Great to hear your perspectives on the lending market. I have a slightly different view, but I totally accept what you mentioned. Very logical. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks a lot for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Daniel, for your very differentiated view. It's really a pleasure to listen to your talk you, 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 everything you, you NFT not, related. <laughs> you must not be British. In England, you say thank you for you. Like, quite a bold statement to make someone... <laughs> <laughs> like, British people make a very uh, euphemistic statements. This is when you say to, when you say to somebody in England, those ideas are very bold. That usually means you think they're insane. <laughs> I meant it in a good way. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just, I'm doing the kind of cultural translation there. <laughs> I was just imagining a British person saying that. She's from Germany, like me, because if I say something, I mean it's exactly literally as I say it. So it was great. <laughs> Not yeah, in British the British. People. And with that, it's a wrap. Thank you so much again for coming on, Daniel. And uh, really enjoyed this Thank episode. Thank you. So then uh, we are done for tonight. All right. Good night. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.
拜拜。Bye. Bye. 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 Bye.